Well, tonight we are continuing our study in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And tonight we are picking up where we left off last time and talking about His work in the life of believers. Last time we looked at three areas. We looked at regeneration, indwelling, and baptism. And we said basically three things, that He makes us alive to God, that's regeneration. We said that He indwells us. And then we said he places us into the body of Christ, that is spiritual baptism. Now we're going to look at two more areas. We're going to look at sanctification, and we're going to look at spiritual gifts. In Romans 8.13, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear that it is by the Spirit that you are putting to death the deeds of the body. It's not by the flesh. Flesh cannot kill anything. If anything, the flesh seeks to remain alive. But every passage of Scripture that speaks of the believer killing sin is attributed to the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit. You and I cannot kill sin on our own. And as we look at this area of sanctification, we need to understand that it's the Holy Spirit who sets us apart to God. He does it initially at salvation, and He does it daily in our lives as believers. Before we go any further, let me take just a moment and define our terms. We talk about sanctification. That's a pretty big word. Uh, Many times we think that that is just a word that theologians have come up with, but the truth of the matter is, is that word is translated that way. And take just a moment and turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where you can see the word being used. He says in verse 3, for this is the will of God, and then what? Your sanctification. That word, sanctification, has the basic idea of being set apart for or dedicated to God upon the basis of the atoning work of Christ. It does not denote the state of holiness, but it is telling us the process of, of being made holy, becoming more and more in character, more and more in conduct of that which God desires us to be. We could say that sanctification refers to a state of being set apart from sin to holiness. Sanctification is occurring constantly in our lives. If you look at that passage you, you see this process of becoming holy. Look at verse 1. He says, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction as to how you ought to walk, that is your conduct, your attitude, and please God, just as actually you do walk, but that you excel still more. There's, there's always room for us to grow. There's, there's never a point in this life where we could say we've arrived. We know everything that, we, that there is for us to know. We've arrived at this perfect behavior. Uh, no, that's not happened, and that will not happen until heaven. There is a progression of sanctification, a progression of being set apart. There's a progression of being made holy every single day in our lives. And as I was stating earlier, that if we would begin to look at the things that God is doing... The, the good things that are occurring, instead of focusing on the bad, because when we tend to focus on the bad, we, we get all consumed with that. Whether it's something in our life that we're struggling with, or whether it's something in a bigger picture that we're involved in, we, we kind of get consumed with that. We, we get our perspective warped, we get off of what we need to see, and what God is doing, that the bigger picture is that He is at work. Like it says in Philippians, He has begun a good work in you. But when we talk about sanctification, that's what we need to see. All of these things are for our sanctification. All of it. Because everything works for our good, according to Romans 8.28. Everything. And what I'm afraid of is that we're not seeing that. That we have gotten our eyes off of that, and we've gotten our eyes on the circumstances. We've got our eyes on unhappy people. And folks, we need to quit basing our joy on those things. You obviously can see that you can't base your joy on that, right? Have you been joyful in all that? 
Even though James says, you know, to count it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, and the context of that was they had been scattered because they were preaching Christ and they were being persecuted for the gospel of Christ and they were scattered. Their, their church was, was torn apart because of the persecution, not because of people being unhappy in the church. They were sold out to the gospel. They were sold out to the truth. They were preaching the gospel everywhere they went and it was causing persecution. So much so to the point that it was driving them away from that area. And James writes to his scattered flock. He says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. You know that all the trials that we experience, whether we experience them personally or together as a church, is a test of our faith. It's a test of who we are trusting, what we are trusting. And my assessment is, is I think we're failing the test. Because I think that we're focused on so many of the wrong things. Instead of focusing on the fact that this is a test, this is a test that we can overcome, this is a revealer of what I am trusting. And I hope tonight that you see that. And I hope tonight that even right now you see that and you say, you're right, I have been trusting in the wrong things. I haven't been trusting God and what He is doing. And maybe I don't understand what He is doing right now. And you know what, folks? He doesn't have to tell you what He's doing. Does He tell you every time you go through a trial what He is doing? What we have is right there in James chapter 1. Testing your faith. And what's He tell you? He tells you to count it all joy. Count it all joy when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, but let perseverance have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. These things are for our maturity. These things are to grow us, not scatter us. You know, we did a survey. The survey says, <laughs> I always wanted to say that. <laughs> and uh, some of the things we were seeing on the survey was pretty much a, re a repeat. And it was even some of the things that I've actually have seen for seven years. Number one weakness of our church said this, immaturity. I agree. That's been the number one weakness. You know what happens with immaturity? All kinds of things spin off from that. Bad things. Evil things. Wicked things. Um, sometimes some good things happen because when you wake up, you realize that, you know, you need to grow. That's a good thing. <laughs> right? The problem is that we don't always see our immaturity, our lack of growth. You know, we, we want to arrive yesterday. I was like that. I remember that my first few months as a Christian. I want to be so much older. I want to be so much. I, I want to be grown up. We're like little children going, I want to be an adult. And we're not adults yet. We have a lot of new believers. And we have to go through the pain of growth. Just as we have to go through the pain of physical growth. You can't speed up the process. It doesn't happen. Like that. And I look back in my life of 25 years being a believer, and yeah, there are a lot of unpleasant experiences, but I had to go through those experiences as part of my growth. Just as you have to go through experiences in your life to grow you. And don't think the answer is to run away from the church you're in and go to another church. You still have to go through the process. Whether you do it here or you do it somewhere else. You still have to go through it. But don't penalize us for it. Because you're not willing to stick it out and grow. You know, the Bible gives us the answer to growth. Everybody in this room wants to grow. We want to grow individually. We want to grow in our walk. We want to grow corporately in our fellowship. You know what the answer is? The answer is get busy and do the word. Live the word. Live it out. Apply it to these circumstances in your life. And then as you're doing that, minister to one another with what? Your spiritual gift. 